After the Second World War, people everywhere wanted to see motor racing. Many races were held in the streets of cities with little regard for safety. In one such event in January 1949, Jean-Pierre Vemille, the finest driver of those early days, is killed in Buenos Aires. The champion has died just as racing is reborn. But other men of his caliber are ready for the new age that is just beginning. In 1949, sports car racing is off to a fine start with the revival of the 24-hour Grand Prix of Endurance at Le Mans. The big French sports cars of the 30s had many successes here, but now a new generation is challenging the past. An Italian Ferrari goes briefly into the lead on Saturday evening. By midnight, the Ferrari leads again. On Sunday morning, the two-litre Italian car is well away from the rest of the field. For 22 hours on this hot, sunny weekend, Kinetti drives single-handed. By Sunday afternoon, only 19 out of the original 49 cars are still running. Ferrari's brilliant new V12 engine has proved as reliable as it is powerful. It is a great Italian victory. At Indianapolis, there's a new generation of American cars and drivers, but it's as hairy as ever. Few of the sleek new cars are blown, but one of the few, Duke Nalon's Novi Governor, is leading when an axle shaft breaks. In spite of the fireworks, no one is seriously hurt all day. The lead goes to one of the many unblown cars that are beginning to dominate Indy. The first 18 cars all have unblown four and a half litre Offenhauser engines and Bill Holland's 121 miles an hour in a blue crown special is a record. Europe continues to be the home of Grand Prix racing and a mechanic from the small town of Balcarce in the Argentine has been sent over by his government and given one of the latest Maseratis. This is San Remo, where the new Maseratis first appeared triumphantly just a year ago. There are no Alfa Romeos, as the factory has withdrawn from racing after the death of Emil. But the Argentinian mechanic gives the crowd a thrill as he gets his Maserati ahead of all the others. Juan Manuel Fangio is so little known in Europe that when he wins, the cameraman picks the wrong driver. A week later, in the shadow of the Pyrenees at Po, Fangio is first again. This time, the right man is filmed. His next race is nearby at Perpignan. And the incredible Fangio wins his third race in a row. But when the Belgian Grand Prix is held at Spa, Fangio's Maserati is too tired to last even a lap. This gives the slower Grand Prix cars their chance. One of the four and a half litre unblown Lago Talbo is first, driven by Louis Rosier. At Reims, the big French Talbo have another victorious day. This time, Louis Chiron is the winner. The 
the Grand Prix Ferraris haven't had many wins yet, but one is being driven with increasing brilliance by Alberto Ascari. At Silverstone, he beats Farina's fast Maserati by two seconds. His first year with Ferrari brings stardom to the son of Antonio Ascari, the great Alfa Romeo driver of the 20s. Another Ferrari is driven in the Czech Grand Prix by a British driver. Peter Whitehead is defeating the latest Maseratis and Lago Talbo. Whitehead is the first British driver to win a major Grand Prix since Dick Seaman's German victory in 1938. In September 1949, Ferrari reveals a new Grand Prix car. The chassis is longer and the engine with two-stage supercharging is more powerful. On its first outing, Alberto Ascari wins the European Grand Prix at Monza. In 1949, Grand Prix racing lost much of its excitement with the withdrawal of Alfa Romeo. But a new generation of cars and drivers is on its way up. In the 1950 Mille Miglia, there are 375 cars. For two years running, Ferrari has won this great race over the main roads of Italy. But now his champion long-distance driver, Biondetti, is driving for the British firm of Jaguar. Alfa Romeo have Fangio at the wheel of a fast saloon. British cars impress everyone, but spare parts are rumoured to be in short supply. It takes heroism to complete the thousand and more miles in such appalling weather. Outstanding is the driving of the comparatively unknown Giannino Mazzotto, a wealthy textile manufacturer who wins in his Ferrari saloon. It's a royal occasion when Silverstone is chosen for the 1950 European Grand Prix. Moreover, this year, for the first time ever, there is to be an official world champion driver. It's to be decided on the points gained in six major races, and this is the first. Alfa Romeo are back this year with their 158s. A superb new team includes Dr. Farina, once again on an Alfa, and Fangio, the most brilliant of the newcomers. Farina pioneered this relaxed driving position, the correct way to drive modern racing cars. Fangio, in second place, waits for any chance to move up, but has to obey orders as a member of the team. Alpha pit work has been timed to the second, for each car uses up 200 gallons in a 300 mile race. Just a few miles from the end comes an unexpected stroke of bad luck. An oil pipe fractures on Fangio's car and a Conrad breaks. Farina starts the competition for world championship with a healthy lead on points, while Fangio, politely applauding in the background, gets nothing. At Monaco, the position is reversed. Farina spins on the first lap and the cars behind pile into the confusion. 
Fangio has an easy win and draws level with Farina. Alphas don't enter the Netherlands Grand Prix. It's not a championship event. All the same, it makes a pleasant diversion and introduces a friend of Fangio's, Froilan Gonzalez. Two Argentinian Maseratis are a good match for Somair's big Lago Talbo. The unblown car uses less fuel and can do 300 miles on a tank full. But there's little gain when Somair is burning up tires and thoroughly enjoying himself. Gonzalez is refueling his thirsty engine when his hopes go up in flames. The wild bull of the Pampas was second, but now he will have to wait for another day to show if he is a champion. Ozier, driving a Lago Talbo with great skill, doesn't stop for fuel or tyres and wins the first Netherlands Grand Prix. The German Grand Prix is back at the Nuremberg Ring. This year it's for the less powerful Formula 2 cars. The second formula, with its limit of two litres for unblown cars, encourages the use of ordinary sports car engines. The Germans have an AFM and two Veritas, all based on BMWs. There's a team of British HWMs, besides several of Gordini's French Simcas. But the car that dominates this second formula is the two-litre unblown version of the V12 Ferrari. It's an easy win for Ascari. At last, Britain has its new Grand Prix challenger, the BRM. This revolutionary British car with its V16 engine and centrifugal supercharger should be the most powerful of all one and a half litre blown cars. Raymond Sommer himself is driving it in the Silverstone International Trophy and taking on the complete Alpha team and everyone else. Sterling Moss has one of the HWM. The BRM arrived late and is given two practice laps. It's typical of Samir that he jumps at the chance to drive such an exciting but unproved machine. BRM's transmission has sheared and the race becomes yet another high-speed procession of Alfa Romeos. Sterling Moss brings the Formula 2 HWM into sixth place, only one lap behind Farina. BRM's will race again, but this is the last appearance of that most gallant enthusiast, Raymond Sommer. A few weeks later, to lose his life. On the 3rd of September comes the final round for the World Championship, the Italian Grand Prix, and the cats really among the pigeons. Ascari has one of the two new Ferraris that have proved as fast as the Alphas in practice. Both new Ferraris have unblown four and a half litre engines. are challenged at last, with Ascari in second place ahead of Fangio. But the new Ferraris don't last their first race. The 1950 World Driving Championship is won on an Alfa Romeo by Dr. Giuseppe Farina. In 1951, 
there are more new cars at Le Mans than ever, including a team of white American Cunninghams. Outstanding is the C-type Jaguar, and after five laps, Moss takes the lead. At midnight, Jaguars are first and second, but a third is already out with a mysterious loss of oil pressure. Before dawn, Moss has the same trouble. And by morning, there is only one Jaguar left, driven by Walker and Whitehead. They lead by an easy 80 miles, but are two of the most anxious men on the circuit. At four o'clock on Sunday afternoon, Whitehead brings in the first British car to win at Le Mans for 16 years. Fangio goes out in front in the 1951 Silverstone International Trophy. But the scene is changing for Alfa Romeo. Parnell in an unblown Ferrari is right on Fangio's tail in the first heat. Farina just manages to go a little faster than both in a second heat and in doing so breaks the lap record. Before the final, a sports car race nearly finishes off Roy Salvadori's promising career. Then, as the final heat begins, it starts to rain. The Italians and Argentinians are less used to this sort of summer than the British, but it is evidence of the handling of the new Ferrari and of the sheer guts of Parnell that he is in front of both Farina and Fangio when the race is stopped. A few weeks later, it pours again as Fangio wins the Swiss Grand Prix and his first points towards the 1951 championship. In the Belgian Grand Prix, a Ferrari, driven by Villaresi, actually takes the lead for several laps. This, however, is Farina's day, and he drives brilliantly to give Alfa Romeo their second major win of the year, besides getting the lead himself for the World Championship. Farina's wheels spin, and he is left behind as Fangio catapults into the lead in the 1951 European Grand Prix at Reims. But for eight laps, it is a Ferrari driven by Ascari in first place, and the lead changes many times before Fangio gets in front. Villaresi can't hold him. Fangio wins for Alpha and gets the lead back from Farina. At Silverstone, for the British Grand Prix, there are two BRMs. But they arrived too late for Parnell and Walker to practice. This time, Fangio breaks the lap record and leads the Alphas. Parnell's BRM is lapping faster than Farina's winning speed of only a year ago. But he and Walker are way back. The sensation is Gonzales, who, outdriving everyone on an unblown Ferrari, brings about the first Alpha defeat for five years. Fangio is second. By the time of the German Grand Prix, the rivalry between Farina and Fangio is secondary to the threat from the Ferrari team. Fangio takes the lead, but Ascari is tailing him pitilessly. Then the Ferraris go ahead. One Alpha has already gone, but Peach isn't hurt. For a time, Fangio snatches back the lead. 
but the supercharged cars have to refuel twice, and this gives Ascari the race. It is Ferrari's biggest triumph yet, with his cars first, third, fourth, and fifth. The Alfa Romeos have been worked on night and day in preparation for their greatest battle yet with the new Ferraris, the Italian Grand Prix. Farina anticipates a hard race. He is the reigning champion. But Fangio at present leads on points. Ascari is within challenging distance. Gonzalez also has the title within reach. Villaresi claims that the microphone makes his pulse flutter and his tongue tremble. Fangio on 38 challenges Farina for the lead as they streak away. Ascari and Gonzalez are third and fourth. It's Farina and his engine is smoking. He looks equally overheated when he comes in for a quick check. Ascari leads Fangio by yards as the two finest drivers of the new generation fight it out in an epic battle between the two greatest racing cars of their day, Ferrari and Alfa Romeo. Close behind the two leaders is a second Ferrari with Gonzales. This is a race of champions, and the others are all being left further and further behind. With 12 laps gone, Ascari appears on his own. A tire has gone on Fangio's Alpha. Gonzalez waves happily as Ferraris take first and second place. It cost Fangio 34 seconds, and these are like gold to engineer Lampredi and his boss, Enzo Ferrari. At halfway, Fangio's engine breaks, and he is out of the race. Ascari on two leads, but he cannot relax. Farina has taken over Bonetto's car, and although more than a lap behind, is catching up fast. Farina now passes Ascari and gets onto the same lap as he drives one of the greatest races of his life. Much will depend on Ascari's last pit stop, for Farina is lapping at well over 120, faster than anyone today. But Ascari refuels and changes tires in a bare 40 seconds, and although he leaves chaos behind, no one can catch him now. Ascari wins the Italian Grand Prix for Ferrari at an average speed of over 115. Ferrari, like Alfa Romeo, have now won three major events this year. The Spanish Grand Prix is the last and decisive race of the year. The World Championship is still anyone's. 
But the real battle is between the drivers of Alfa Romeo and Ferrari. Ferraris have fitted smaller wheels since Monza to get even more acceleration. And it is two Ferraris that streak into the lead. Ascari on two leads for the first three laps. Then Fangio starts to drive at his most brilliant, lapping a Lago Talbo to gain a few yards on Ascari. Even the great Farina spins. So does Villaresi. The greatest mistake of all is the Ferrari decision to change to smaller wheels. All the team have to make pit stops when the tires fail to stand up to the pace. Fangio drives magnificently on towards his first world championship in the race that is to be the swan song of the 158 Alfa Romeo. For this is the last major Grand Prix run to the first post-war formula. The 1951 World Championship is the recognition of a man who combines intelligence, skill and courage to such an exceptional degree as to make him one of the greatest racing drivers of all time. The champions have come into their own.